May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So, according to Luke, Jesus told the parable we heard read by Brian a few moments ago about a wealthy man who had a manager or steward working for him who was accused of wasting his possessions. And so he called in the steward and confronted him with this charge, demanding a full accounting of the property he was supposed to be managing on his behalf and telling him that he was fired. The accusations must have been true because the manager didn't protest or otherwise deny the charges brought against him. Instead, he pondered what he was going to do now that he was losing his job. He thought to himself how he really didn't have any other useful skills that would put food on the table. I'm not strong enough to dig ditches and I'm too ashamed to beg, he said to himself. Fear and pride stood in his way. And then an idea popped into his head. He decided to ingratiate himself with the persons indebted to the rich man in the hope that they might return the favor and show him similar kindness, maybe even allowing him to stay in their homes after he was fired. And so this sly fox got out the ledger listing the wealthy man's debtors, and then he secretly met with each of them. Without telling his boss, he slashed the debts owed by these persons. One individual owed the master a hundred jugs of olive oil, which would have been about 800 gallons, or the yield of around 450 olive trees, a a sizable debt indeed. The manager told told him to alter the bill to state that it was only 50 jugs that were due, in other words, cutting his debt in half. Another person owed 100 containers of wheat, a yield of about 100 acres. The manager told him to reduce the amount on the promissory note to 80 units. As you can imagine, each of these persons was a happy camper. Of course, the boss eventually found out about these under-the-table dealings. And you'd expect him to be as mad as a hornet. His crooked manager had just swindled him for personal gain as he was going out the door. But that's not how the rich man responded when he learned of this fraud perpetrated on him. Instead, Jesus said the rich man commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. He didn't chastise him. He didn't yell at him. He apparently didn't even glare at him. No, the owner lifted up this crook as an example, a positive example to follow because he was a quick and resourceful thinker, even though at the master's expense. Now, as though that's not strange enough, Luke says that Jesus thereafter told his disciples, I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. That's the NRSV we heard read today. In the NIV, Jesus refers to worldly wealth, which softens it a little bit, but not much. Either way, this parable seems out of line from what we're used to hearing from Jesus which is why it's generally considered the most challenging of all the parables of Jesus. And you can see why I'd rather that my colleagues in ministry from the last three weeks got assigned this one rather than me. I mean, how do you square it with the other teachings of Jesus? What could he possibly have meant by it? This manager was a con artist, a selfish swindler. How could he be lifted up as an example of virtue? One commentator writes, There is nothing edifying about this parable. The steward's conduct was characterized in the beginning by incompetence and in the end by flagrant dishonesty. Wow. Now, some have come up with some possible explanations to water down the offense of the story, suggesting, for example, well, that maybe the owner had himself charged usurious rates of interest to his customers, which ensured, which the steward then was simply giving back to the customers when he cut their bills. Or that these were bad debts so that the owner was happy just to get anything from his debtors. Or that the interest on the debts was really the steward's profit, which he was releasing when he slashed the debts. Now, these are interesting suggestions, but the problem is there's nothing in the text indicating any of them to be true. And so I think we have to take the story at face value and try to figure out why on earth the owner applauded the crooked steward for his bad behavior 
and why Jesus said what Luke reports him as saying to his disciples. You know, the challenges of this parable remind me of the story of a mother who one Sunday morning went to wake her son and tell him it was time to get ready for church, to which he replied, I'm not going. Why not, she asked. I'll give you two good reasons, he said. One, they don't like me. And two, I don't like them. His mother replied, I'll give you two good reasons why you should go to church. One, you're 59 years old. And two, you're the pastor. <laughs> this is one of those mornings when I might have wanted to remain in bed, and it's not because of jet lag. But I'm the pastor who got this scripture, and so here goes. This parable, oddly enough, reminds me of a 1967 film I really enjoyed. It came to mind the other evening as I was preparing my thoughts for today. It was How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying. That musical was based on a Broadway stage musical of the same title and starred Robert Morse in both settings as J. Pierpont Finch, an ambitious young window cleaner who buys a book describing step-by-step -step how to climb the ladder in the business world. And he follows its advice meticulously, but the advice was not always ethical. And from the bottom rung of the mailroom of the worldwide wicket company, he rises rapidly eventually to become chairman of the board by ensuring that everyone above him is either fired or transferred. Now, I'm embarrassed to say that there's something endearing about J. Pierpont Finch's character, and while I wouldn't condone his methods, it's hard not to admire his gumption. Perhaps that's how the wealthy owner saw his manager. He too was a lot like J. Pierpont Finch in his shrewdness, which Jesus acknowledges as a positive quality. Maybe we need to open our eyes to seeing the steward in a different light. In his 1924 work, The Exemplar of the Rabbis, Moses Gaster tells of a folktale which may do just that. In the tale told by Gaster, a man is caught stealing and sentenced to hang for his crime. And as he's being carried to the place of execution, he says he knows a secret that the king should be aware of and that he would share with the king before he's put to death. He says that he will bury a pomegranate seed in the ground and by a secret means taught to him by his father, the seed will amazingly grow and bear fruit in just one night. Well, everyone in the kingdom, including the king, wants to witness this miracle. And so the man's execution is postponed so that he can demonstrate the secret that he had shared. With all the citizens of the kingdom and the king watching, the man digs a hole, but then he says the seed can only be placed into the hole by someone who has never in his life stolen anything or kept something that wasn't his. Well, all of those present, including the kingdom officials and even the king himself, realize that at various times in their past they've been guilty of some indiscretion which disqualifies them from planting the pomegranate seed. And then the thief says to them, you have power and want nothing. You cannot plant this seed any more than I can. Yet I am to be hanged while you are to live. The king is so moved by the thief's argument that he pardons and releases him. Maybe what you and I need in order to understand better the parable from Luke is a change in perspective. We listen, as did the disciples, to Jesus telling the parable and describing the unsavory character of this sly manager, and we see him for what he is, a scoundrel, a sinner in other words. This man is out for himself, and he'll bend the rules and do whatever is necessary to get out of a jam. He squanders what's been given to him, and then he lies and cheats when he gets caught. We cluck our tongues and roll our eyes at this miserable man, which is why it's so hard to hear his employer praise him for his cleverness. Here's the question, however, that we might want to ask ourselves. Just how different are we from this man? Just how different are we really from this man? Now think about it. Hasn't God given us an amazing bounty of blessings? As we study the scriptures, we learn that we're really considered stewards, caretakers of what God has given us. In a sense, you and I manage God's property. 
It's not our own, it's God's. We've just been given possession of it for a while. The big mistake too many folks make is believing that all they have is the result of their own efforts, so they can do anything they want with it. So, giving to the church, well, when we believe what we have is ours alone and the product of our solo effort, well, then we're inclined to give God only what's left over rather than our first fruits. On Friday, students from across the world protested about climate change and the poor response they perceive world leaders to be taking in response to this serious issue. Putting aside personal political positions on the causes of climate change, I think we can all agree that the Bible makes it clear that we humans are God's stewards of creation of this planet. The book of Genesis proclaims that truth in the first chapter. I think it's also abundantly clear that we haven't always done such a great job taking care of the environment. We've squandered what God has given us, very much like the dishonest manager in the parable. So young people have a good reason to be concerned about what we're doing or not doing about climate change, given that, we're going, given that they're going to inherit this world for better or for worse. And we haven't had the best of track records. I had my eyes opened in another way last Sunday evening to the poignancy of this parable. Shortly after 9 o'clock, Kristen and I were walking along a bridge across the Seine River in, in Paris, and it was a wonderful evening. But then all of a sudden, Kristen just out of the blue said, asked, is that the moon? Well, I turned to the left, and just over the horizon, this orange glow was coming up on, on the horizon right next to the Louvre Museum. We took a bunch of photographs as we stood there watching this magnificent sight as the moon rose beautifully. It was the most beautiful orange harvest moon I think I've ever seen, or one of them. And it was a beautiful romantic sight, and it was glorious, and we just stood there soaking up all of that. It was just a fantastic thing. And, and as we stood there on the bridge, I happened to glance over to my left, and, and I saw two other couples who were seated on benches, enjoying conversation, but they were facing in the opposite direction. And so I kept thinking, wow, they're missing this incredible sight right over there. They've got their backs to it. And, and I couldn't get that out of my mind. I felt so bad for them because we were just having this great experience and it was all wonderful and romantic and fantastic. And, and I just kept thinking, I almost felt, I felt I had an obligation to make sure they knew that this was going on. And so against my better instincts, um, I decided to go over and, and, and point this out to them. Well, my, my French is almost non-existent. Kristen speaks French, so this was already a, a, a potential challenge. But nonetheless, I decided to go over and tell them. And so I suddenly appeared before one of the couples, and I, I started pointing to the moon, which was, of course, behind them, and saying, the beautiful moon, you know, and trying what little French I had, and, and trying to get their attention. And um, they, uh, the first couple thanked me, uh, with some nervousness about my approaching them in the dark talking about the moon. And um, it went even worse with the other couple. Uh, as the woman, who was very French, dismissed me summarily by saying that they had already seen it. Uh, <laughs> it was obvious that she wanted me to leave, which I did quickly, embarrassed and feeling awkward for having creeped out two couples with my apparent lunacy, pun intended. Anyway, as I've reflected further on this unfortunate experience, um, I've had another insight. And, and I realize that this kind of reveals just how much I'm like the shrewd manager in squandering what God has given me. You see, God has given to all of us the greatest gift ever, ever, the good news of Jesus Christ. And yet I was more excited to share about a harvest moon than I was to share about the salvation that Jesus offers. Now, I'm not saying that I or any of us should be running up to strangers and acting all goofy about the rising sun as I did with the rising moon, again, pun intended. But I have to acknowledge that too often I don't have the same sense of joy and urgent desire to make sure that others know what I know about Jesus. I'm not always looking for a way to point them to the risen Savior. 
This past Friday's Upper Room devotion was right on point, as was its scripture passage from Romans chapter 10. Verses 13 through 15 were particularly apropos, in which Paul writes, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard, of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Interestingly, the author of Friday's devotion wrestled with her failure to share the good news of Jesus in the way she at first thought she should. But then she came to the conclusion that showing love was the most important way to witness to Christ. And I would agree with her. That's a lesson for us as well. But it's still essential that we be intentional in our efforts to share Christ's love and hope. Otherwise, we might be squandering what God has given us, much like the dishonest manager did with what he was given. So the twist in this story told by Jesus, and by the way, that's typical of parables taught by Jesus. There's usually a twist or a surprise ending that gets us thinking in a new way about the kingdom of God. The twist here is that you and I may not be all that different from the selfish steward. As in the folktale of the thief who said he would plant the pomegranate seed, you and I have not led perfect lives, and we're just as guilty of sin. Included in such sin, in my opinion, is how we've squandered what God has given us to manage in various ways. We've not done all we can with what we've been given by God, whether it's the environment or our resources or the gift of God's grace. And when that becomes apparent to us, we sometimes act not all that differently from the steward in the parable. We cut corners when we can, and we try our best to remain in everyone's good graces. In other words, we look out for ourselves. And so given that we frequently squander what God has given us, and that we often tend to be self-centered, what has the Lord said about us? Surprisingly, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. We listen to the parable of Jesus and we feel derision toward the unjust steward when in fact we're all unjust stewards. We're just as deserving of punishment for our failings. Every one of us could be dismissed by the one in charge because of how we failed again and again to be the righteous people God wants and calls us to be. Just imagine how God must view us as we feel nothing but contempt for someone like the selfish steward in the parable when in fact we're not much different ourselves. Well, now you understand the twist in this story when the rich man doesn't heap criticism after criticism on this manager but instead speaks well of him. In spite of all the ways you and I might fall short in the eyes of God, God in Christ nevertheless speaks well of us while hanging from the cross and saying, Father, forgive them. John Buchanan pinpoints the two choices the wealthy landowner had when he learned of his manager's indiscretion. He could have thrown him into jail, but this would have been quite the party crasher as those whose debts were reduced were probably already celebrating the manager's generous and kind actions. Or he could absorb the loss and pay the price himself for his steward's salvation, Buchanan says. And that is what he does. He shows unusual mercy, amazing grace, and then he commends the steward for his shrewdness, his sense of priority. John Buchanan shows how the parable reveals something very important about God when he writes, It is a subtle point. God's amazing and dependable graciousness, God's unexpected and always surprising willingness to love us and accept us. This man is not a moral model for anyone, but to his everlasting credit, he knows what the most important issue in life is and where to take it. He knows somehow that he can depend utterly and ultimately on the generosity and grace of his master. That's what you and I can do as well. We can depend utterly and ultimately on the generosity and grace of the master. 
Just as the master in the parable saw something positive, something worth redeeming in the conniving manager, so too does our master, Jesus Christ, see something worth redeeming in us in spite of our selfishness and many failings. As he did with the parable, Jesus surprises us with his unconditional love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.